So what, what, what do I call you? Um, I know you go by your pen name is WK. Right, right. But I, you know, people call me Kip. Kip, Kip. Okay, got it. Yeah, All right. Should I, K -I should I call you Kip then? Yeah, that's great. Okay. J just don't call me Mr. Stratton. That's your dad. Well, no, I, that's what lawyers call me. And oh. That's that's way scary. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I don't want to cause anxiety due to some sort of association. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and to further show respect, I won't ask you about your legal issues because <laughs> apparently you <laughs> thrice divorced author Kip Stratton. There you go. I'm holding up for those listening. I'm holding up my copy of uh, The Wild Bunch, Sam Peckinpah: A Revolution in Hollywood, and the making of a legendary film. You know, I was in a bookstore a few months ago. And they still exist, which is a terrific thing. I was at a Shakespeare and Company, and uh, I was walking in there, and I came across a table with non, you know, new nonfiction, and there was the book, The Wild Bunch, your book. And I, I love bringing on authors who can talk about whether a film or a filmmaker. I just I enjoy that very much. So I said, yeah. let, me, well, I, let me, I took a picture of the, you know, the book, and I said, let me contact the publisher and see what, and it all moved very quickly. So I'm very happy about that. Oh, well, good, good. I, I have, uh, I work with a great publisher, I mean, a great publicist at uh, Bloomsbury, she, Tara Kennedy. Oh, yeah, really, she is great. Just gets on the job and gets it done. Yes, she really was really efficient and um, expeditious, and so it's all good. It's always a pleasure when these things fall into place. I'm in New York City. You are in Austin, Texas. Correct. A place I enjoy visiting usually once a year. And you can yeah. probably guess why. I bet it has initials. <laughs> you are correct. Like an S and two, two S's and an X and a Y. Or an W. <laughs> and sometimes you have to ask yourself why, but yeah. <laughs> because of the... Uh, my, it's funny, I was supposed to go. I had my credentials. This year I'm talking about, I go, I've been there. Usually go. Two, usually works out where I go two every... Out of every three years, I'll go two years and then I'll take a year off, that kind of thing. Not intentionally, it's just life and truth. So this, my son, who I mentioned is his mother is working as a job in Los Angeles right now so he's been living with me full time so i ha we had just come back from Los Angeles from visiting her and i really just didn't have the you know the time off to do another trip plus with him you know i couldn't justify my trip to south by so this year i spoke at south by southwest so uh, you, what you was, could have cast, you could have got me there <laughs> i know well i should have sent him but i didn't know that what was the event well, this was, uh, I, they, they have a thing called author readings, okay. but, uh, but readings has taken, uh, you know, not, uh, liberties be very specific. And what I did is a, a presentation more than, than reading from the book about, right. um, uh, bridging cultures in the wild bunch. And so I very started good. off by showing, a. Uh, slide of the bridge being blown up so I mean, if you're bridging cultures in the wide wild bunch you really have to have that yeah. bridge exploding <laughs> a lot of people i know that listen to my show are filmmakers and a lot of those guys really adore peck and paw you know of course they haven't met them <laughs> they never met them <laughs> right, right. well you know the, no. the thing about sam peck and paw uh, as a filmmaker uh it, it's hard to find any director who came up through the Hollywood system, who was more gifted at, at the art of filmmaking than Sam Peckinpah when he was firing on all cylinders. Uh, he knew the art of story. I mean, you know, uh, Sid Field, uh, who's famous for his books on screenplay writing, uh, Sam Peckinpah was his mentor on how to write a screenplay. He, you know, Sid Field learned at his knees. Uh, he uh, understood photography you know how to tell a story with a camera he understood how a good score should work he understood lighting he understood all, all of the technical aspects and he understood how to get actors to give the best performances of their career in some cases uh, so he had all of these these things going for him as a filmmaker and and i think on a picture like the wild bunch which is his masterpiece um uh, everything just really fell together in an amazing way and showed just how talented he is he was uh the the 
downside to that is that he had many, many personal demons that uh, mm. ranged from his uh, substance addictions, you know, starting out with alcohol, then later in the 70s, expanding to cocaine and God knows what else. And uh, also just this kind of uh, inbred thing in him about not getting along with authority figures you know, <laughs> yeah. who ran studios yeah. and producers. He just seemed to, to mm. have uh, uh, an issue with anybody in a place of authority, which makes it really difficult when they have the checkbook, you know, to allow you to do your art. Yeah. And well, he was uh, hardly the, alone the there. Thing is he had this, for, for whatever reasons, had this intense paranoia that, that drove people close to him crazy. And so the, the, the downside of, Peck and Paw's story is that his these these flaws he had kept him from producing as much as we might have wanted, and to have achieved ultimately a, a string of films that could have been even greater than what he left us. Although what he left us is very very good and very intriguing. Yeah, I'll say I love discovering his more. Not obscure, but his lesser known works. The works that he's less, you know, less, the, the deeper cuts, let's put it that way. I, I, yeah. Like yeah, Bonner, I Junior it, Bonner, you know, you know the, bring me the head of Alfred, you know, Alfredo Garcia, et cetera. Yeah. You, you, you look at his career and, uh, you know, he, he, he's kind of tailing off pretty seriously after Alfredo Garcia. But then he does Cross of Iron, you know, which is Orson Welles said yeah. was one of the great, uh, war movies ever made and he said it wells actually said it was the best war picture done since uh, all's quiet on the western front in terms of a, a story being told from an enlisted man's point of view yeah but what did uh, what did he wells, know yeah what did wells know about making movies but uh, yeah come on you know then but then you you know immediately after cross of iron he did convoy and that that mm. was the absolute uh, yeah the, the worst yeah, that's that was a shame, but you know, I, you know, I, I actually draw close distinctions of all the filmmakers that come to mind as you talk about Sam Peckinpah. I'm thinking about Hal Ashby. Oh yeah, yeah, a lot of parallels Hal there. Hal Ashby is, uh, you know, did some wonderful work. Oh my uh, gosh, the '70s with, uh, his, uh, with his peak, I think, coming with Bound for Glory. I think maybe is my favorite picture of his, but he did a number of really good films. But then, you know, his, his personal issues and, and, and struggles with substance use and all that ended up where he did some really bad work toward the end. That and with the combination of also, though, having alienated studio executives. <laughs> and, <laughs> he went down the Peck and, yeah. the Peck and Paul Highway there. <laughs> did you happen to see the, not to get too far afield here, but did you happen to see the documentary about Hal? No, I have not seen that yet. Okay, do yourself so, a favor and... You should watch it. It really sets. I'll tell you, the filmmaker came on my show oh, as cool. well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I enjoy bringing authors like yourself as well as films about film. You know, it's just sort of a natural for this particular podcast. Even though I bring on directors and actors as well, but I enjoy when there's a documentary about the film world in some level or a filmmaker, and then bringing on the the, the you know the doc, the filmmaker for that, and you get a great in depth conversation. Uh, right. You know, but anyway, I see some parallels between Sam Peckinpah and Hal Ashby, although they couldn't make, in some cases, more different films. But no, no, but, you're you're right about that. And but yes, but in, in terms of mm -hmm. their distrust of studio heads and that sort right. of thing, you know, yeah. very similar. Yeah, you know, I I watched uh, Shampoo recently, and for the first time in a number of years. And, a lot of people say that was really Warren Beatty's film that, that Ashby was sort of a figurehead uh, director. But I, as I watched it, I decided that was far from true. Uh, there were some really nice Ashby touches in, in, in that picture. And, you sure. know, his, right. His, his work is uh, is just astonishingly good. And of course, then there's the last detail, and we go on and on. About sure. That. I, yeah. I would say maybe Shampoo was just the exact right combination of filmmaker and lead actor producer what have you at the right moment and so maybe that's where some of that confusion comes in or it could be that that's the way warren Beatty chose to you know market the film that was his you know much yeah, like yeah. bob evans would and there are certain people that are just their egos are so enormous you don't get the sense that how ashby's ego 
he was going to push it back against something like that. You know, he just, I I never sensed that that Ashby had much ego really. A lot of that, but man, what a filmmaker he was. Um, Peckinpah, there's no doubt that with the wild bunch, which was what year? 1969. It was filmed in 1968, Mm -hmm. first half of 1968 and released in June, 1969. And there's no denying that this was him at his height of his, his powers and his career, do you think? I, I think so. Although, uh, you know, I, later in life, he was, uh, I think, a little perturbed at times that people paid so much attention to the Wild Bunch and yeah. ignored his other films. Sure. Uh, but I, I think so. You know, he, he'd done uh, just a, a monster of an achievement in Ride the High Country mm. uh, before that, which is sort of one of the last of the old style traditional Westerns while at the same time, uh, leading kind of opening the door to revisionism in Westerns. You know, I came out in 62 along with, uh, Ford's the man who shot Liberty balance and, yep. and uh, the lonely are the brave. There were a number of interesting films came out the year. Yeah. The high country was great. He, um, he kind of blew it on, uh, major Dundee, mm. uh, problems with the studio and a lot of studio interference but he also he went into that uh went into production with a bad screenplay that really needed a lot more work and he made some bad decisions as a young director that that also contributed to the problems that picture had Mm -hmm. and then he uh uh had been hired to direct the cincinnati kid and was fired off that picture after one week of shooting Uh, uh, the legend holds he was Fired for shooting unauthorized nudes of uh, nude footage of Anne Margaret. Well, but, come on, uh, <laughs> but that that's not what happened. It was just the producer didn't didn't want him to be the director anymore. Didn't like the direction Sam was going to go, so he got fired off that. Then he went, you know, most a year and a half as being, uh, as as a blacklisted director in Hollywood. Being in in, in director jail, what yeah, they call director it? jail. And, uh, you know, the, one of the things I think is interesting about the Wild Bunch is that it was mm-hmm. his chance to uh, redeem himself as a director. And, uh, you know, he not only redeemed himself as a director, but I think he turned out his greatest work while he was at it. And it just, uh, yeah. you know, what, what a story that was. Right. And That's why I wrote a book about it. You know? Thank you for doing that. Sure. <laughs> it was very sure. enjoyable. Again, it's called The Wild Bunch. Uh, Sam Peckpaw, A Revolution in Hollywood and the Making of a Legendary Film. Uh, why was this film, which maybe youngins nowadays might turn it on and, you know, they'll see some great acting, great w- actors with some great chops like William Holden and uh, maybe see like somebody who they like Ernest Borgnine, who they hadn't seen quite in such a serious role, as well as in some of the greatest character actors in Hollywood in the day, uh, yeah. but like Warren Oates. Yeah. People that have these tremendous reputations, but why, other than the collection of these incredible actors in one movie, why is it that this film uh, is iconic? I don't think a lot of young people would realize that nobody had seen a Western like this before, or violence yeah. portrayed like this. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that, that boys, there are a number of things to talk about in, in, in terms of that, but one of the things that happened uh, just prior to the production of The Wild Bunch was the release of the Sergio Leone films in the United States starting in 1967. Okay. And and suddenly, and, and Peckinpah has tipped his hat to um, a fistful of dollars as having an influence on The Wild Bunch. I can see that. The thing that Sergio Leone did is he showed the West as being really dirty, you know, and we know if you read history, it was not a, a cleaned up place. It was where people didn't bathe. Uh, people wore really ragged clothes and, you know, hygiene wasn't the best. And- you know, the only way that what the, 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 the only way to kind of block out someone else's unbelievably horrible, stinking body is is to have your own. Right. right. <laughs> you know, otherwise, I don't know and, how it and, works. And smoke really bad cigars or pipes. Oh, yeah. Right. That's, that's right. But, yeah. And then you look at the, like those films, Leone's, you've got people with flies walking on their faces. Well, right. Oh, well, know, yeah. What, what was it? Uh, 
hunchbacks and all kinds of weird things that turn up in those. And and I think for a major American Western, mm-hmm. uh, Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch was the first one who went down that road and said, okay, we're going to make the, the West really dirty. If you look at uh, Strother Martin in The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, there, uh, he's wearing... Look very closely in his costume. He's wearing a shirt with plastic buttons that looks like it just came from the dry cleaner. It's got nice, crisp, uh, you know, creases in it and, and all of that. His hat's kind of beat up a little bit, but his clothing are really clean. Look at him in the wild bunch. Hmm. And he he looks filthy. And, and you know, he's, uh, he's, he hasn't shaved in a couple of weeks. His teeth are all yellowed. You know, it was it was very much a realistic portrayal of what some of these characters look like in, in the West. So that's one thing the, the Wild Bunch did. Uh, it, from a, a movie perspective, it, it, it hit on so many cylinders just right. Lucian Ballard, who was one of the great cinematographers in Hollywood history, mm-hmm. uh, shot the film. He and Peck and Paul had studied footage from the Mexican Revolution mm. and, and seen uh, some of the... Um, newsreel footage and they tried to duplicate that look as much as possible and also to uh to give it that that feel they wanted the the whole picture to have kind of a sepia tone to it which it ended up doing but they achieved it by exposing the the raw film to a little bit of light before shooting you know that huh. was it something that was achievable to give that that sepia look through the whole film that the technology of the time except to just expose each can of film just a little bit right that so you know you had this great photography through the whole thing um I should, we should just uh, mention- there's a, there there's some uh obscenities that turn up in it that you're not expecting from the typical john wayne western of the late 60s true uh which is more realistic uh i don't i not don't know not quite dead I, not quite dead with curse on this podcast yes you are okay uh sam peck and paul his friend jim silk and lee marvin uh went to see Lilies of the Field mm-hmm. when it opened in Los Angeles. And after it was over, Big Lee Marvin was climbing into the back seat of, of Jim Silk's little Mercedes, and he said, well, there's another picture where no one takes a shit. Yeah. You know, which I think is a great line. Uh, they yeah. Didn't, they meaning... didn't have that kind of stuff in movies. But you look at the Wild Bunch, there's literally a scene where, where you see Edmund O'Brien going off to do just that, and <laughs> uh, it, it brought that level of realism to a movie that had not, it just hadn't occurred in American uh, movies of any kind, Westerns or otherwise. Yeah, he, and, and, and the big thing ahead, that received a lot of attention at the time and continues to be a, you know, a source of conversation is how Sam Peckinpah portrayed violence in, in this movie. Uh, he made he was he was impressed by um, some of the violent scenes in Shane from you know 13 14 years earlier uh, in which you know violence is shown as being bloody and dirty and uh, that that was pretty different from what had been in American westerns before that mm-hmm. so he built on that in the wild bunch and you have uh, um, you know just, then using squibbing technology in, in a different way than it had ever been used before. Describe uh, for instance, that. if someone if yeah. had an actor who was getting ready to be shot, uh, Peck and Paul would squib that actor in the front and in the back. Mm-hmm. It just so just make sure squibs, uh, make sure people know what that what a squibbing is because I don't know that everybody knows. Oh well, squib in the in you know again uh, in the late 1960s there there really weren't. There was, well, there was no CGI for sure. Anything that appeared in a movie had to be created in some way and filmed. And so uh, a squib was a device that, uh, that involved originally a, a condom uh, filled with stage blood with a little explosive device underneath it. And this would be uh, taped onto an actor's body with wires running from it underneath the clothing. And if someone was to be shot with a blank pistol, the blank pistol would go off. Someone on the crew would push the explosion button, and suddenly you would have a burst of blood up here on the clothing of the person who got, quote, shot, unquote. This was used by Arthur Penn, 
uh, very effectively in Bonnie, Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde. Of course, the year before uh, the Wild Bunch went into uh, production, uh, Peckinpah took it a st- step further. He put squibs on the front and the back. Mm-hmm. And if someone was getting shot from the front, he would then have a small ball of hamburger meat placed on the squib in the nice. back. Nice, nice. So if someone, and then they were all connected to the same switch, they would go off at the same time. Right. And when that went off, you suddenly had a burst of blood on the front then you and on the back, but you also had something coming out the back, so it gave right. the impression of the bullet going through somebody. Which was which actor was it that refused to? Um, wasn't there one of the actors who was getting who using who, who you know had squibs used on their body, but re- refused? Wasn't it uh, what's his name the um, the young guy who? Oh, uh, Bo Hopkins. Bo Hopkins, who ended up, of course, uh, working on a number. <clears throat> excuse me, working on a number of Burt Reynolds movies. Right. Uh, Bo Hopkins, who this was his first uh, feature length film, by the way, he'd done yeah. a little bit of TV before this. He, uh, he'd, uh, the, the guy who came up with the concept of the Wild Bunch, uh, Roy Signer, a stuntman, had known Bo Hopkins and he recommended that Peck and Paw use him. And he did. He played the part of Crazy Lee in the opening shootout. And I think he did really a, an amazing job in that role. Yeah. But uh, the actors who had worked with Squibs had figured it out. They said, okay, I'm going to wear a T-shirt between my outer clothing and the Squib and the T-shirt to give my skin a little protection because it hurt when those little charges went off. Sure. But uh, Bo Hopkins refused the T-shirt because he wanted to to feel that (laughs) in order to get a more more realistic reaction – whenever he was, quote, shot, unquote, in the picture. So, and, and you know, he was he was very good in that uh, well, that's, that sequence in which he gets killed. Well, to quote uh, Laurence Olivier in a, a very oft-quoted uh, conversation with Dustin Hoffman, Oh, yeah. He's like, try acting, my boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a reason they call it acting. <laughs> Uh, but um, yeah. but he was trivial. Yeah, I mean, but and, and I think uh, you know, Bo Hopkins was not alone in in his dedication to what they were doing. I read a, a, a fairly obscure interview with uh, uh, Warren Oates, who said, you know, when we got down there, and this was filmed, of course, in, in Mexico, you had a sense something special, something something unique was occurring. And everybody kind of got into it when they yep. sensed this, and uh, uh, so it, everybody was was going all out. And, and I had several of the surviving crew members tell me that uh, William Holden and Ernest Borgnine, all, all of those people, they became their characters while they were down there. They became the wow. Wild Bunch. Well, uh, and so uh, what they they carried on those mm-hmm. roles after they finished shooting for the day. Well, it makes sense, right? It, it, they were living far remote from the closest Hollywood studio. But um, Oh, yeah. In, yeah. In, in 1960, this was shot in uh, Paras in southern Coahuila in, in Mexico, which was right. a remote town about 100 miles from the nearest uh, a city of any size, Torreon. I've been and, there. Uh, do what? I've been there. I was in Torreon. Were you? Okay, so you know. Yeah, I had a... Uh, uh, but, but in 1968, if you wanted to get a, you know, have a, make a long-distance phone call to Los Angeles and have any sense of being successful in that, you had to fly to uh, to <laughs> Rion and, and make the call from there because even in for us, long-distance service with operators and all of that was kind of hit or miss. So it was really a different time 50 years ago and, and really tough circumstances where they were filming this. You bring up Mexico. You brought it up before. I should mention that what's what another nice component of your book is the you give context to the making of because there's a direct, in a way, a relationship between the story that, you know, of the Wild Bunch, which is these guys going down to Mexico to escape the law or those hired to kill them. Because they just uh, robbed a railroad office, and they were now on the, t- and they went down to Mexico, where there was uh, the Mexican Revolution was going on. There was opportunities for them, financial gain, etc. And then 
you in you make all these connections in the book also about what was going on historically in Mexico where the movie takes place but also when those guys went down to shoot down there as well and how the there's still a strong historical connection to the Mexican Revolution yeah and i, I think uh, uh one person uh, peck and paul always gave credit to for uh you know developing this story was Waylon Green uh, mm-hmm. peck and paul did a lot of rewriting on the, the screenplay but Waylon Green wrote the initial okay uh, screenplay and the story really never changed after Waylon Green came up with it uh Waylon Green was a, a Hollywood kid mm-hmm. uh who uh as a teenager, had the opportunity to visit Mexico, and, and this would have been in the early 1950s when he first started going down there. Then he decided he would go to college in Mexico City. Mm-hmm. So he was he was living in Mexico City and going to college, and uh, through a classmate, he met a surviving general from the Mexican Revolution, a guy named Rios Trinche. And uh, they became fast friends, and uh, the old man liked to tell Waylon Green stories about the Mexican Revolution, which he stored away in in the gray matter. Then after he graduated from college, he got a job with a Mexican swimming pool company, and his job sent him to every state in the country. Everywhere he went, he kept finding in the 1950s these survivors of the Mexican Revolution, these old men and old women Mm -hmm. who... Mm-hmm. wanted to tell him their story. So he just absorbed a lot of this. Now, mm. I, I don't know what other people's experiences are, but I went through uh, my public school education and through four years of college, and the Mexican Revolution never came up at mm-hmm. all in my no. education. And even though it was uh, just across the river from, from the United States and it's the right. most violent uh, event that ever occurred in North America, you know, so many hundreds of thousands of people killed, but it was just you know, ignored. So, and I'm sure that, that people like Waylon Green, they had kind of similar experiences. So he's getting all this stuff that just wasn't available in the United States. And when Roy Sickner hired him to draft a treatment and then a screenplay, Sickner's idea was to set this in the 1870s, and Waylon Green said. Well, you know, Roy, the 1870s were kind of a boring time in Mexico. Why don't we do this sometime during the Mexican Revolution? And Sickner said yes. And that, that I think, was a huge decision in terms of making this, this picture successful. Uh, then Green, as I said, he came up with the complete story. Uh, Sam added some characters, did a lot of work on dialogue, added some scenes, but it was it was Roy uh, it was it was Waylon Green's story, and it's directly he used that material he would learned as a young man from talking to all of these survivors of the Mexican Revolution, particularly Rio Sotiche, who uh, I think can, a lot of those conversations led to Green developing the character of Mapache the way that he did. Mm. Yeah. So there's a, mm-hmm. it's really literally grew out of the Mexican Revolution in that sense. And, of course, Sam Peckinpah was very interested in the Mexican Revolution. He loved Mexico. He loved right. the Mexican people. He probably right. at times romanticized Mexico a little bit, but he did love being there. He, his great love of his life was the uh, mm-hmm. uh, Mexican actor Begonia Palacios, whom he was married three different times. Mm-hmm. And I think divorced three different times. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he was, he loved Mexican culture and he absorbed a lot of that himself. And for, uh, you know, a movie project that he ended up being fired off of, he studied a lot about the Mexican Revolution. Mm-hmm. And um, so he, he knew quite a bit himself compared to most Anglos in the United States of the 1960s. Right. Well, you said yourself that it wasn't in our history books. I, I think we're probably, generally speaking, in the same generation, of the same generation, p- perhaps, you and I. Uh, and, you know, brown people are, um, brown people uh, were not considered worthwhile in terms of, unless, you know, I mean, they were marginalized. And uh, it's it's interesting. So Sam Peckinpah, incidentally or accidentally, ends up making a relatively political film. <laughs> I don't know if that... I don't think it's polemical by any stretch, but it was certainly turns out that he was saying something very large by just making the film there and presenting Mexicans as three dimensional people. Uh, I guess, you know, it was incremental. It wasn't exactly a um, 
trying to suggest that they were equal to North Americans or, you know, you know but nor was any, in any way marginalizing them. And it's interesting watching this, the film again, which I did, of course, recently in tandem or during reading your book is because Mexico, I think, I've heard has been in the headlines. Yeah, right, right. Where we're and, trying to, uh, our what, hardest what, to marginalize what I these think people. What's interesting is that um, in the 1910s, the Rio Grande River, uh, you know, the Rio Grande mm-hmm. uh, was a war zone, pretty much. There were tens of thousands of American troops stationed along the, the north side of the river. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, and, and so it's, it's very similar in, in some ways to what's going on now, 100 years later. Uh, with with the, the troops and so forth, um, and and there was great controversy at the time about incursions by Mexicans into the United States. And, yep. And so there, there there are a lot of similarities. But you know, also I think the Peck and Paw. Jim Silk told me Peck and Paw never shot a foot of didactic film. That wasn't what he was about as a filmmaker, but. He was not making the wild bunch in a vacuum at all, and he, it was filmed in 1968. Uh, they, uh, the company went to Mexico to, be, to begin filming uh, shortly after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Uh, they wrapped filming shortly after the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. I think it's a, a telling marker that kind of in the middle of, of that, um, the My Lai Massacre occurred in Vietnam. Of course, no one knew it at the time. It was, no year or so later before that came out, but Vietnam, certainly the Tet Offensive and, and all of these things were going on and you, people saw bodies mm-hmm. on the ground and news right. footage and from Vietnam and, and, and soldiers returning. And and we had a lot of violence in cities uh, going on as well based on racial strife yes. at the time. Plus, you know, 1968, we had the police riot in Chicago with the... Uh, at the Democratic National Convention, yeah. so all these things were going on at the time Peck and Paul was making this picture, and and as I say, nothing happens in a vacuum. So this this I think a lot of that is seeping into this, even though it's uh, he had no intent of making some kind of allegory. About it seeps in what's going on, but he didn't right. try to make a message about violence. He did say that he was hoping that if he showed it the way it really was, that it might have some kind of cathartic effect on film goers who, who were dealing with all of these violent events going on in, in the world. And right. people would say, it's time to stop this after going through this catharsis. And, and of course, uh, six years later on the BBC interview, he said that he failed at, at achieving that catharsis. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's very... It wasn't his intent, but you can look at this film as being allegorical from America in the 1960s as well. And I just want to make sure we mention all the lead actors in this. I mean, just to also give it some context in terms of what we're talking about, how, why this was such an, a, a huge n- a movie. Uh, William Holden, Ernest Borgnine, Robert Ryan, Edmund O'Brien, who yeah. another John Ford actor. I guess you could say right. Warren Oates, Jaime Ch- yeah. Sanchez, who's a bit, who's a star here in the in uh, Hollywood as well. So even yeah. though he was from Mexico, right? Or is he from? No, he, sorry, no, he was Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. That's right. And he had to no. learn how to uh, do a, a Mexican accent, right? In preparation, right? right. He's, he had to learn how to speak uh, Spanish with a Mexican accent. That's right. And then he t- made sure. it more challenging was to learn how to speak English. With a Mexican accent, oh, right? English with a Puerto Rican accent. That's right. It's, yes, and if it, I'm very good at that kind of. No, thing. he was. He was, and, and he's still living. He's one of the few people still oh. living from this. Uh, yeah, most Sanchez of these... is an interesting guy. He was in the original off-Broadway cast of West Side Story. Incredible. And he was in the original Broadway cast of West Side Story. So he's a yeah. He's a guy with musical theater background. He's a New York guy. Well, some of that show. With these guys down in Mexico making this cowboy picture. Well, it shows he's not, able to sing. I thought he really excelled as an actor in this myself. He also sings. Was that his voice? That's his voice. Yeah. When I interviewed him, he sang to me over the phone. Wow. And it, it was very interesting. His voice, you know, he's, he's around 80 now. And wow. His voice uh, sounded like that of a man of some age. But when he sang, it was sort of like uh, on hell in the movie again. <laughs> you know, he, when 
singing the H one away from his voice. You mentioned he's uh, one of the few surviving people from the film, but of course he was a generation younger than most of the cast, oh, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, at the yeah. time. He was, he was born in the late 1930s. So right. And, My dad's Holden, age. Holden would have been 100 years old this year. Wow. So. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about William Holden before we uh, wind down. Cause, but also I just want to mention the rest. Ben Johnson, who is just terrific. A real, real cowboy who was also a, a member of John Ford's company. That's right. Strother Martin, guy who was also like an old-time Hollywood actor, had a big comeback, right? A revived career in the, uh, I guess, late 60s again, and, you know, worked uh, through that whole period into through the 70s until he passed away, I guess. I mean, he, he yeah. just, uh, if he, and of course, he's best known for Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman, of course. Did I leave anybody else out? I guess uh, there's a number, L.Q. Jones. There's a lot of character actors. Yeah, and, Karen, and L.Q. Jones is another one of the people still living. He's oh, he is? He's in the early 90s now. Wow. He, he I didn't, gee whiz. And he's still, he's still ornery. And, what about uh, Bo Hopkins? <laughs> Bo? He's, uh, hmm? Bo Hopkins? Bo Hopkins, yes. He's alive? He's, he's still going. Great. And he, he spends a lot of his time these days, you know, showing up at... Uh, 1950s uh, auto shows and things like that. Oh, because, is that right? Yeah, because of the uh, oh the the George Lucas film he was in. Uh, American oh, Graffiti. of course, American Graffiti. How could we forget? Of course, yeah. that's a uh, icon. Oh my God, I loved loved that movie. Um, yeah. I want to just talk about William Holden, you know, and let's remind people you can get a copy of The Wild Bunch, the book by this. Great author W. K. Stratton. You can pick this up at almost any bookstore or order it online, and it's uh, it's published by Bloomsbury Press. What an interesting <laughs> I mean, William Holden. I don't think a lot of people know this is uh, one of the biggest Hollywood lead actors. Or let me rephrase that: he was one of the lead actors who came out of Hollywood. Who I'd say he was certainly one of the most successful and popular. He was at the top of the top tier. Of Hollywood leading men, and yet also just really battling demons. Uh, and, and you you um, brought up this whole part of him that I had no idea. I thought I knew a lot more about him, but you brought up this whole thing I had no idea about how he would perform these life threatening stunts. Right. I had no idea about this, and he even did some of this on on the set. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a photo that. Uh, I, that's in the book. a pretty rare photo uh, that was taken on the on the set of the Wild Bunch, even where uh -huh. he's wearing his his outfit for the movie, which includes uh, boots with riding heels and spurs, <laughs> and he's doing a little tight tight wire walk on one of the uh, the guidelines for the guidelines for the bridge that's getting ready to be blown up, you know, above uh, a swollen uh, Rio Nazis below him and. Uh, and I think, wow, what the, what the hell is your star of your movie doing out there on this? Uh, Holden was uh, born in the Midwest, but he essentially grew up in Pasadena, where his dad had a mm -hmm. uh, chemical business. And he, he ended up, for reasons I don't entirely understand, but he, he felt like he let his family down. And uh, mm. that was always at the, the core of things. He would never wore fame comfortably. His his real name was, his last name was Beetle. His name is Bill Beetle. And uh, he would be with a friend and walking down a street and see a marquee with William Holden across the top of it. And he would point at it and say, that's not me. I'm mm. just Bill Beetle from Pasadena. Mm. You know? And he also had this, this strange... Going back to uh, his teenage years, this kind of strange uh, death wish thing going on for him in that uh, he would go out to dry lake beds out in Southern California on a motorcycle and just open it up and just go, hap you know, this haphazard speeds and people would go, why are you doing this? And, and then there's the famous suicide bridge in Pasadena uh, where... Uh, he would walk on his hands. He was a gymnast. That was his sport. It was, right. it was gymnastics. He'd walk on his hands along the railing when there's like a thousand feet to the to the dry arroyo below. Amazing. And one night, one time, he even rode a bicycle along that rail, and, and it just freaked people out. And some of that a stayed bicycle. with him through his whole life. And he became, uh, he had uh, 
problems getting ready to act and early on someone said well just have a drink before you go on or two drinks before you start acting work be sure to brush your teeth afterwards because right. no one wants to smell alcohol on the set and he started doing that and he became a serious serious alcoholic uh, leading up to just shortly before the filming of the wild bunch he had been in a drunk driving driving accident in italy in which he killed a man and he had a criminal right. conviction for that and had a suspended sentence hanging over him at the time. What else was hanging yeah. over him as a result of that? I mean, come on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so he's got... He's I mean, got he had, well, plus, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd been one of the... He was an incredibly handsome as a younger actor. You know, he was one of the best-looking men in Hollywood. Right. So, and you could look at those movies from the early 1950s and see that. Yeah. By the late 60s, a lot of that had gone away. You know, he had some serious lines forming in his face. He stopped watching his weight carefully. All of these kinds of things going on. Smoking, uh, drink, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the Wild Bunch, he just decided. And I should say, William Holden, all through his acting, his career, he was a major movie star. But he also had serious, serious acting chops. That guy knew how to act when he had the role. Now, a lot of times... He would be in movies and walk through them because he didn't think there was any challenge to them and right. just collect the paycheck. Okay. But when it came time for him to act, like in Sunset Boulevard and, and so other pictures, uh, he was really a great actor. And yeah. The Wild Bunch gave him a chance to redeem his career because he'd been going downhill. Uh, he'd been taking, made some really bad uh, uh, film choices through the mid 60s. And he was considered pretty well uh, irrelevant to the baby boomer audience. Uh, yeah. But the Wild Bunch, he gave such a great performance uh, in that role of Pike Bishop that yeah. he suddenly became relevant again as an actor, and particularly sure. to younger audiences who've gone to see this picture. Yeah. Um, well, he brought all that gravitas, as you mentioned, and whatever burden he was carrying around. And certainly there had to be a burden from causing the death of uh, the other person in that accident you mentioned but well, part, part of the part of pike bishop you know at the end there there is kind of this self-loathing you know sure. this character because he he betrayed his his best friend robert ryan's robert character ryan. before, who, who's now who's now and, going after him who's now yeah. been hired to bring him to justice yeah yeah or kill him and uh uh yeah in order to keep him from going to prison back to prison and it was holden's fault that he went to prison in the first place you know it's complicated I see. situation but, but right. you know you get the sometimes great film actors of course do a lot of their acting with just their eyes and their face and and there are scenes there were holding you can just tell that character of pike bishop is reflecting on his life and he's not happy with what he's reflecting on and yeah. uh, right. a lot of self-loving comes out in this uh at different times and I, I thought Holden was just absolutely brilliant in well, this picture. Yeah. Well, you obviously weren't alone at the time. He ended up, of course, yeah, like you say, his career was revived as a result. And, you oh, know, yeah, and then and he moved on, you know, later. Network. The network did a lot of, you know, yeah. things that were... Some of the best work of his career. Yeah. I'd say between this one and, and Network, I mean, stands up to anything else he's done. And, he, and the gravitas, really, he brings it with him. You know, it's this whole other dimension to him. That makes him uh, utterly watchable. You know, you buy into his performance without any hesitation because uh, oh, yeah. all that he yeah. he brings with him as an actor. Yeah, I agree. By so, the way, that, that is one thing that Peck and Paul was really good at when he was at his at his peak. He 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 got his actors to really go deep inside and bring that stuff out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, very effective. Do you know what you're going to write about next, or maybe you're already onto something next, or? Is it too you soon? know, there, there, there are some uh, some projects that are being kicked around. Uh, there's possible another film book uh, that that the publisher is interested in. There's there's also uh, a lot of interest in a, uh, a nonfiction book that will deal with uh, aspect of the West and outlaws and mm -hmm. uh, the railroads and, and things like that, and a story that really hasn't been told. Yeah, so that I think that's probably going to be the next one that's going okay. after the, the outlaws. Okay. Uh, who, by the way, uh, this particular group of outlaws who were active in Oklahoma Territory, mm -hmm. 
were the original bunch to be called the Wild Bunch before the newspapers applied that to Butch Cassidy and the Sunday Butch Cassidy's game. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah. In the real history books. In the real history, <laughs> right. Gotcha. <laughs> well, this has been totally fun, and I really so glad that it all worked out, as I mentioned. So I hope we covered everything, or at least a good part of things that make uh, uh, listeners, you know, tantalize them enough to uh, get them to get a copy of the book and read it. It's a it's a very pleasurable read. See the movie and then read the book, or read start reading the book and see, watch the movie while you read the book, because it just becomes a much more uh, immersive and exciting process. Yeah, I, and, and thanks. This has been been great too. This I, I wrote this book with more passion than uh, anything else I've written, and I think I brought some of my own mm. gravitas to this book. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> and, uh, when yeah. I, we won't go into that. My, okay. You know, the parole officer doesn't like me talking about some of these things, but uh, but no, it, it was just uh, an was amazing it? experience for me to to research this book and to write it. And, and the people who are surviving from this film, they all went out of their way to help me. It was just right. an entirely positive experience all the way around. It was a catharsis for you? And I think there was some catharsis in writing this book. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Well, please let's stay in touch and uh, certainly let you know when I post the podcast, which I'll, I'll try to get around to doing sooner than later. The book has been out for a little while now, but we want to try to sell some more copies. Especially, sure, sure. especially while it's in hardback. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, this has been great, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. It's wonderful. And absolutely, let's stay in touch. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it very much. Okay. All right. All right. Have John? a good weekend. All right. You do the same. We'll talk thank soon. You. Okay, Kip. Thank you.